Dr. Fred, in, in your clinical practice, what are some of the common issues that you see coming at you from a Christian perspective? We see a lot of, um, a lot of marriage issues, a lot of uh, interpersonal issues, a lot of family systems issues, stuff that went on in their family, things that have hurt them and they've carried into their adulthood. Uh, so yeah, we've, we've, uh, we've done a lot of that. We've seen um, uh, sufferings of every, every kind you can think of. Um, you know, I think of Isaiah chapter 53, uh, uh, where Jesus was a man of, of suffering and he was familiar with pain. And when you think about that, you think about the fact that we all have pain. We don't like to acknowledge it because the Christian part of us says, well, you know, I should, when I pray, God should do something now. Like, God, give me patience and give it to me now, you know, if you would. Uh, but we do, we suffer, all of us suffer from a multiple different array of things. I have ADHD, so I'm like, like an alcoholic. I am ADHD, okay? <laughs> it's, it's both a frustration and it's a rush, <laughs> to be honest with you. But we all have something um, in the body of Christ. We're not like anybody else, unlike anybody else, I should say. Uh, within the body of Christ, within ministry, within leadership, uh, there are things like depression, uh, and depression has multiple different stages to it, but a lot of people are depressed and they suffer from that and it enters into their, their lives and into their marriages and into their adulthood and into their jobs. Uh, issues like anxiety, um, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, you know, I'm angsty all the time. What do you think about that? Can I straighten that, you know, that picture up? And that belongs over here, this belongs over here. No, I can't do that. I'm a Christian. I don't go through that kind of thing. Yes, we do. Uh, anxieties are or very prevalent PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder uh, that can happen in war, but also, you know, women who have had abortions. Um, um, it can happen with sexual trauma and, uh, and that from their childhood, uh, if somebody was controlling over them in that kind of a tragedy, if they're in, in their adulthood and they sense control from somebody, uh, it, it kind of feels like it's, it's like a, it, it takes them back to where they are or where they were uh, in their trauma. So these things exist and people pray constantly to God. God set me free from these. And God in his sovereignty at times miraculously does that. And other times he doesn't. I remember I was on a television show when I was first saved, the uh, Larry King show in Baltimore. And uh, I had just come off of drugs. I was out of the Air Force, maybe safe for about a year. And when the red light went on, you know, I, <laughs> Fred, what do you think? He, I was the testimony guy. And then my friend was going to be telling the, uh, you know, talking about the Bible. And I didn't know what the heck I was doing. And I went home. I said, man, that was an opportunity for me. Um, and I felt stupid because from my childhood, my father said, that's what you are. Armandio stupido. You're, you're very stupid. And so I thought, uh, that's what I am until I found out who I was in Christ. And I realized that I struggle at ADHD, <clears throat> uh, attention deficit, and, and it uh, affected my focus ability. And God did a big work. He made me a preacher, made me have to concentrate a whole lot more. <laughs> but the fact is, I wish he had set me free from it, but he didn't. But he showed me things through that that I would have never have seen had I not failed in that moment and allow me to empathize with other people who go through failures and connect with their pain. Um, <clears throat> depressions and anxieties, I mean, they're either situational or they're genetic, situational. Um, you know, I'm, I just lost my job, my house burned down, and my dog died. I, I'm depressed, uh, I, I, it's horrible. Um, or uh, genetic, uh, I'm depressed, uh, my Aunt Lucy was depressed, my Uncle John committed suicide, and so I see this family systems kind of thing around me that, that, that causes that to happen. So. It's not, you're not weak or less than because somehow you have anxiety or depression. I mean, listen, Martin Luther, let me just share a couple uh, people with you. Martin Luther, the great reformer, so all of the Protestants come from, he suffered constantly from depression. The man drank more beer than he ever should have. He self-medicated on it. And we all self-medicated off of something. Jesus wants to walk us through that so that we can depend and rely and dwell in his peace. But Martin Luther, he was, I mean, his, his wife would go up, there was one case, and she screamed to the top of her voice, God is dead, which brought Martin Luther out of his bed. And uh, he said, don't ever say that in this house again. And she said, 
Stop acting like he is. So he had to kind of deal with his stuff. Martin Luther was a great depressant. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, the great prince of preacher, preachers uh, in England, massive man of God. Sometimes he would find him underneath of his, under, un, un, underneath of his desk, uh, frightened, or uh, his moods would change constantly, his deacons would say, possibly a mood disorder. He suffered greatly from that, uh, and he admitted it, and he talked about it. By the way, Martin Luther talks a lot about his depression. John Wesley, the Methodist Church. John um, suffered and writes about his depression and uh, how it affected him and, and with, while he was ministering. Mother Teresa, this woman of God, uh, the last year of her life suffered tremendously and said, you know, God's, I'm, I'm not good enough. I should have done more. What else could I have done? What T did I not cross? What I did I not dot? She struggled. These were strugglers of God, but they struggled well. The moment we think that we have to have arrived and stay at that high water mark, it, it then we deny our humanity. Consequently, we're not allowing ourselves to be open to the miracles and the goodness and the grace of God that changes in the midst of the struggle. I mean, addictions in and of themselves. Uh, we think of drug addictions for the most part, but there's a lot of addictions. I, I listen. I, I counsel people in the body of Christ who who have drug addictions, who have struggled with alcohol, um, gambling addictions, uh, eating addictions, spending addictions. Um, and then, of course, there's, there's sexual trauma, sexual addictions. Uh, we have a, in our center, Life Counseling Center, there's a, um, light, uh, we have an underground, which is for men who struggle with sexual addictions. Men all over the country come to this. And it, the enemy wants us to think as a result of these addictions, sometimes there's something that you come into, but often we find there's a reason for these addictions. Um, say, for instance, let's just talk about sex and porn, the addictions that come with that. Uh, what it really is, it's not about sex at all, not at all. And you would think, well, that's crazy. Of course it is, because that's how I'm acting it out. What it's really about is a lack of genuine, legitimate intimacy, the likes of which we only find in Jesus Christ. And so men f look at that, and it comes from often they've either been something's happened to them or they haven't really accepted or received any kind of legitimate intimacy and care and love uh, that has uh, caused them to be able uh, to connect, maybe a, a distant father, or maybe they were abused in some way when they were a child. So they acted out in that way, or they eat a lot, somebody eats a lot, and they acted out in that way because they're self-medicating because something is wrong inside their life. Symptom cause, again, symptom cause. The symptoms are, uh, you know, I, I, I look at porn, or I, I eat a lot, or I, I drink alcohol to an excess of these things. That's the symptom. What is the cause? Jesus loves the cause, and he wants to go to the cause. Um, like the woman at the well. She, you know, so she wants this living water. And Jesus said, well, I want to give it to you, but what I want you to do is go call your husband. And so she said, well, I really don't have a husband. He said, you're right. You're living with a guy right now, and you've had five husbands. He could have said, you fall so short. You're so messed up, lady. Get yourself taken care of clean up, come back, and we'll have this discussion. But he didn't do it. He showed her this extraordinary, not natural, agape love that said to her, I love you enough to keep this conversation going. And once she, he got on the husbands and stuff, she said, I got to get out of here. Hey, look, let's talk about religion. Your people worship in Jerusalem. My people worship in the mountain. Can we get off this subject? He loved her so much, Don, that he said, no, not really. Uh, the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. That's who the Father seeks to be, his worshipers. But we've got to walk through this because you want this living water. And so he began to share with her, blew her mind. She went into the town, told these guys, this couldn't be the, you know, the prophet or the Messiah, could it? That just so happens to be. And then he had an opportunity to share the good things of God with that whole town. And that life came into those people and that woman because he loved them. He didn't look at her addiction or a problem. Now she probably, five husbands, he went in her back. He went in her, he went in her past. I don't know what time and frame five husbands are, but it was a time there. Five husbands and the guy she's living with, something was going wrong in her life and he wanted to find out what that was. 
was a symptom and it was a cause and she won because she stuck in there and Jesus loved her to the point that he didn't concentrate on her negativism, but rather he embraced her <clears throat> with the love that he had. Another quick case in point is uh, Cain and Abel in Genesis 4. Uh, God asks him the question. I think questions are fantastic. He says to Cain, he says, Cain, why are you angry? I mean, check it out. Look, you're about to do something very terrible. And before you do that, you need to know you're losing your edge. And sin is around the corner. It's come to master you, but you must master it. That's the hope. It's come to master you, but you must master it. It gives us hope. Cain, unfortunately, didn't have that conversation. And he killed his brother. Symptom. He killed his brother. Horrifying. The first murder in the Bible. That's bad. Why? Well, because I think you like him more than you like me. It's always about Abel. You accept his offerings because Abel gave the firstborn of his offering to God. And Cain kind of gave the trash that was left over from his field. And God was trying to show him something, but he wasn't going to have at it. Symptom cause. Um, you know, we're, we're, we, we kind of, we operate in a couple different ways. Uh, there's like, it's, we operate in temperament. Uh, I like to talk, you don't. Uh, I, I like to engage, you don't. This person will talk with you, that person, the other person, the person behind you, will talk with a mannequin. He doesn't make any difference who he talks to. Another person, if he's got to talk with two people at the same time, they'd rather have a series of paper cuts. So the fact is, temperament is different. We all have different temperaments, and they're God-given. And then there's learned behavior. Uh, what did I witness as a child? Uh, did my parents have difficulties? If they did have difficulties, how did they work it out? Uh, did I learn from them? Because life is about struggles and difficulties. Or did they just, you know, kind of put it under the rug? We don't talk about anything, rules and roles. And so we don't talk, we don't communicate, we know there's something wrong. It's the 500-pound uh, gorilla in the middle of the living room, but nobody talks about it. So temperament and learned behavior, family systems is very, very big with us. Um, it, it shows us uh, um, how we struggle and how we can maneuver around that struggle. And it's part of the atomistic chapter three, verse seven in Genesis. So these all derive uh, issues, derive from issues that we have. Some of them spill over into mental health issues. Bad news, we have mental health issues uh, to some extent. Some people weigh more than others. The good news, God is able to do exceedingly abundant beyond all that we could possibly ask or think. I am not less than because I struggle with something. I can do all things through him. And if I connect with that, I'm going to find myself not just struggling, but struggling well. Well, that makes me think. Really makes me think about humanity versus spirituality, being carnal versus being spiritual. And that's really the heart of it all. Mm -hmm. The transition, the gauge between the two. If we're in the flesh, we're going to respond in the natural. If we walk in the spirit, we'll respond in the spiritual. And all of us, thousands of times a day, are someplace in that sliding gauge. And that's really the heart of what you're, what you're telling us. Is yeah. When you get into that side, there needs to be some steps taken to get you over to this side. And that, but, but here's the good news. We're all on this side sometimes. Because mm -hmm. one of the things the devil wants to do is to tell you, you're the only one that has those kinds of thoughts. You're the only one that feels that way. That's right. You're depressed, but boy, every other Christian is happy and joyful and they're just full of the Holy Spirit and man, couldn't have a better day. Well, see, that's a lie. The Bible says there's no temptation or test taken to man that's not common. That means that it's a, it goes to everybody. That's why I'm so glad we have you with us and your, your work struggling well as a tool. And we'll offer this to you to input it into your life so that you can start changing your thinking. See, that's the deal. Change our thinking will change the way we live. It'll change the way we operate. The computer gets reprogrammed with the truth, the truth of the word. And the, the, with, the, with the book comes the DVD. So it's an hour plus of a DVD, breaks it down by, by issue, by chapter, by, by a verse. So it's a Bible pathway, practical application of, of ways that a clinical mental health professional who loves Jesus helps people find their way. Isn't that what we're talking about? Finding their way. Because we're all on the path. And now sure, when we get to heaven, it's all going to be phenomenal. Jesus comes here to earth. It's all going to be great. Until then, 
we endure and we persevere. So with your gift of the ministry of $25 or more, we want to put this into your life. Let it be a seed, a catalyst in your life that will change you forever. And that's what I want. I want to be changed forever. Because when we get changed, you see, when, when there's a spark, a God spark that happens inside of our life, changes make happen there, happen in the natural, spiritual to natural. When that happens, stories like this occur.